Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's Professor Emeritus of Psychology at Arizona State University, and today we're going to focus mostly on his book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. So, Robert, Dr. Cialdini, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's good to meet you, uh, Ricardo, and uh, to be with your audience. Great, thank you so much. So uh, let me first ask you a general question before we get into the seven principles of persuasion. So what is the psychology of compliance and what are what is the sort of questions that you tackle there? Well, the psychology of compliance involves the practices, the techniques of moving people to say yes to your request or request a recommendation or a proposal without changing the merits of it, the features of it at all, but only changing the way you present those features, those merits, uh, to move people in your direction. Mm -hmm. So let's get into each of the principles. Of course, we're not, get, we're not going to go very much into depth. Uh, when it comes to each of them due to time constraints, but starting with reciprocation, what is it about? Yeah, people say yes to those they owe. So to move them toward assent, you should do something for them first so they feel a sense of obligation or gratitude to you and you significantly increase the likelihood that they will comply with a request that you make of them subsequently. Could you give us just a brief example of that? There was a study done in a candy shop um, in Southern California, where uh, one week uh, for half of the customers, as they came in, they were greeted warmly by, a, by the manager and escorted to the candy counter where they could make a choice. The other half were greeted warmly and given a small piece of chocolate those people were 42% more likely to buy candy. That, they that's had been amazing. given something first, even though it was a minor, small thing. Yeah. And what about a liking? Liking principle is one that would not surprise any of us that people prefer to say yes to those they like, but there are two things that a communicator can do to significantly increase the likelihood that uh, a, a, a recipient of a message will like us, right? The first is to point out genuine similarities between us. Right? The other is to give genuine compliments to the recipient of our message. And both of those increase the sense of rapport that, our, that the recipient feels uh, with us and, be, and they like us more and are more likely to say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is social proof. What is it about? So social proof uh, involves the, the tendency of people to say yes to your request if you can show them that a lot of people like them are saying yes to it or have been saying yes to it in the past. Uh, and give us just one clear example of that. Uh, so, it, for example, in a, in a pub in uh, London, uh, researchers asked the manager of the pub to honestly put up a sign that said, the most popular type of order that a beer order that we've had this week is our porter our porter beer sales of porter doubled when people were simply honestly informed of what the majority of those around them like them were choosing uh, and what is authority authority is it involves the uh, the tendency of people to say yes to you if you can show them that you're an authority on the topic or that established authorities agree with you on the topic. 
So you can get through, authority either directly or indirectly through yeah. other people. Yes. So you can show your credentials, your experience, your background, or you can show testimonials from established experts who have positions that are similar to yours on the topic. So in a sense, that second aspect, aspect of authority would also include a little bit of social proof, correct? It's not social proof because social proof is about peers. But, is it a, but you have put your finger on something that's, I think, very important. If you show that the majority of experts agree with you, you get even a stronger impact of authority, right? So multiple authorities are significantly more successful in moving people than a single authority because the impression is not just, oh, this authority agrees with me. It's that authorities agree with me. Uh, and what about scarcity? What does scarcity mean here in the context of persuasion? People will say yes to you to the extent that you can show them that what you are offering is scarce, rare, unique, or dwindling in availability. People want more of what they can have less of. So that would include examples like, for example, you going to the Amazon website and seeing there for a particular item only two left. Only two product. left, yes. So, for example, there was a study of 6,700 uh, commercial websites. And the researchers looked at the factors in their websites that most lent themselves to conversion of a visitor to a purchaser. And the number one was scarcity of number of available offers. So if there were only two left, that sort of thing, that was the most powerful of all the features of all the websites. Moving on now to commitment and consistency, what does it entail? It involves the tendency of people to say yes to your request if you can show them that it is consistent with what they have already said or done in the past. So if they've made a statement, if they've taken a position, if they've acted in a certain way, right, and you can show them that what you are advocating is congruent with what they have already said or done, they become significantly more likely to say yes to your request. Could you tell us about a particular context or situation where this principle would apply? Well, so for example, one of the things that uh, people ask me when I give presentations on these principles, somebody in the audience will say, how do I get my boss to com comply with what I have to say? Because um, my boss is, he, he only takes his own counsel. He doesn't, he's not easily reached his position of authority by making judgments based on his own standards, his own values and, and uh, choices, right? Mm -hmm. So what I say is, well, if your boss is only listening to himself or herself, right? Show your boss something that he or she has said in the past at a, in a, a speech he gave or at the last uh, company meeting um, or in the letter to shareholders or in some kind of position that's consistent with what you would like your boss to move toward. Let's say it's um, transparency or ethics or employee choice, whatever it is. You find something, you have to do your homework, you find a little time in which your boss has said something, has taken that position in favor of diversity or transparency or whatever it is. And you say, I'm so glad that you believe this because my initiative is consistent with your position. 
If your boss is only listening to him or herself, you have to show <laughs> your boss when they said that in the past, because that's the only person they allow to be to, to persuade them themselves. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, these six principles we've just talked about were the original ones, and then you added unity, correct? Yeah. So yes, you, yeah. why did you add that principle? Well, I noticed uh, not only in the research literature on compliance and change uh, that this factor was a powerful one, but I noticed as well around us I see the impact of tribalism, the tendency to say yes and to favor those individuals, important category with us, a category that reflects our identity in some way, a political uh, party or religion or a region of the country or something where we feel indicates who we are, right? is part of our identity. If somebody uh, reveals to us that they share that identity, we, be we become significantly more likely to favor them and uh, follow them. And that identity, it can be any sort of identity or is it that it just works in for particular identity? It can be any identity that people feel is an important component of their own identity, a feature that defines them. So there was a lovely study done in uh, the UK where uh, <clears throat> they, re researchers arranged for someone to collapse on the side of the road while a lot of people were uh, going by, right? And if this person was wearing a t-shirt that supported the home, the, the city's home football team, Manchester, he was much more likely to get help. He was one of them. There was a study done in the United States. I'm sorry that I'm using uh, US examples uh, frequently, but that's where I know of the research. And, um, Researchers asked a young woman about college age. They had her dress uh, in uh, similarly to college students and go on campus and stand in front of a table uh, asking them to contribute to a good cause. In, it was called the United Way, right? So, and she was getting some compliance with this as she asked passersby to con uh, to contribute, but if they asked her to add one sentence to her request, they increased conditions by 450%. So what was the sentence? The sentence was, I'm a student here too. I'm one of you. And people become very much more likely to say yes to someone who shares their identity. So now that we've gone through the principles briefly, how did you get at these principles? What methodology or methodologies did you apply here? Well, first of all, I spent the early part of my career studying the influence process in my laboratory, where we would ask college students to uh, give us their opinion or make a choice based on a message we gave them. And if we presented that message one way, we would get a certain level of compliance. But if we presented the same message a different way with different words or a different component of the, of the request, that increased significantly. So we registered those factors that would increase the likelihood of compliance uh, with a request. But I realized that studying college students' responses in a university laboratory wasn't telling me what was most important to move people in the real world, in the world outside of the university and my 
antiseptic laboratory where everything was controlled. So I thought, well, you know, there is one kind of person who knows what works in the world around me, and that is practitioners of influence, people whose business it requires that they get others to say yes to them. Salespeople, marketers, fundraisers, advertisers, negotiators, and so on, right? So how could I get access to what they knew? They, they didn't want to tell people what they had learned. That was proprietary information for them. So um, I entered their training programs undercover as a spy of sorts, right? With disguised identity, disguised intent. And I learned what they said they used to get people to say yes. What was the most successful and reliable way to get people to say yes to their requests? And I did that for two and a half years, entered all kinds of training programs. And what surprised me was how small the footprint was of the number of principles that they all used. There were just six. And then I added the seventh unity after, after uh, I noticed that I had failed to register that one, but there were only six. There were the principles we were talking about that they all used. And that's where I then checked in terms of the research literature yeah, those principles have been shown to be powerful in laboratory studies too. So we had validation that in controlled situations, those principles worked. And in naturally occurring situations, those principles worked. So those were the ones I decided to write about in my book, Influence. Uh, one to a chapter, I, cho I chose each one. And I have to say, Ricardo, that book has been very good to me. <laughs> it sold more copies than I could have possibly sensibly imagined in more countries and languages um, uh, than I could have imagined. I have a colleague in um, Poland, uh, Professor Wilhelmina Wosinska. Mm -hmm. She said to me one time, you know, Robert, your book Influence is so famous in Poland, my students think you're dead. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's on the one hand of affirming comment, on the other hand, it's a kind of a sobering one. So that's why I wrote the new edition of Influence, to add the newest work to show people that I, I, I wasn't dead, I'm still active, I'm still writing, I'm still thinking about the influence process. So. I added 120 pages to this new edition. And since we, you're still active and you ended up adding a new principle to the list, do you think that this list of seven principles is exhaustive or that possibly in the future you could find some new ones? Yeah, I don't think that they're exhaustive. I mean, I think they're the most common principles that are employed. But they're certainly not the only ones that cause people to say yes to requests. But they're, I think they're the most primitive ones. They're the ones that are most fundamental to our decisions to say yes to someone because they normally counsel us correctly to say yes. If a lot of people around us are doing something, it's wise for us to follow what all those around us like us are doing. If they're choosing a new film or a new restaurant or a new piece of software, it makes sense for us to sample that too. If, if this toothpaste is the largest selling, well, I'll probably be, I won't be far wrong if I choose that soup. Same thing with authority. If all the experts are saying that something is right, and now I hear that it the experts are saying that this particular product is the, or this idea, or this service is the best. I won't be far wrong 
if I see that something is truly scarce, about something that's valuable and it's dwindling in availability, I won't be far wrong if I choose it, right? Uh, so uh, those are, that's why I think these principles are so um, popular in the repertoire of sales and marketing and influence agents because they are the ones that people most benefit from when they are truly part of an influence situation. But apart from those contexts, would you say that these principles would apply in any social context? Yes, I think they do, but not at the same intensity. They will change from certain kinds of principles. So principles that have to do with uh, relationships, for example, they'll be most sense uh, th those relationship requests and so on will be most sensitive to uh, things like liking or reciprocation what have i done for for my partner and so on there's research to show that this is the case and the same applies across cultures i think uh, in all human cultures these principles have been shown to be effective but the, the weight of those principles varies from culture to culture, which is the most powerful will change in different uh, 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 societies and, cu and cultures. So for example, uh, um, there was a big study done uh, by Citibank. Right? It had locations in many cult many nations around the world, and they decided to do a study of what their managers, when their managers would say yes to a particular request from another manager, one of their colleagues. And uh, this was a request to have some assistance on a, on a program that wasn't the managers, it was this other person's. So could you help me by giving me some time or maybe some of your personnel to help me on this project? And the question was, under what circumstances would you be willing to say yes to your colleague? Right. And uh, they, they did this in four different uh, regions of the world, four different cultures. Um, British-based culture, so the UK, Canada, the US, uh, Australia, and so on. The, the answer that was most likely to get a yes, or the, the, right, the, t the principle that was most likely to get yes, was one that, that uh, applied to the following answer that they gave. It, so they said, well, I would ask myself, what has this person done for me recently? If this person has helped me recently, now I have to say yes. So that's the principle of reciprocation, right? Now, you'll be interested in this, in the Mediterranean cultures, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, it was different. The answer was, is this requester connected to one of my friends? If so, I have to say yes out of loyalty to my friend. In the Far East, Japan, China, Korea, the answer was different again. It was for the top answer. All of the principles worked, but the one at the top changed in the Far East to, is the requester associated with my boss? Right. So now it's not liking or friendship anymore, it's authority. Right. So, and then finally, it was the Scandinavian countries and Germany. What was it there that was at the top? It was, according to the rules and regulations in my, of my company, am I supposed to say yes to this requester? 
commitment and consistency. They had made a commitment to this country and company, and they were going to be consistent with its rules and regulations. Now, of course, people in, Libs in Lisbon care about reciprocity and they care about consistency, but the one at the top changes depending on the culture, the history, the precedence of that uh, na nation. So uh, what I would say is that all of the principles work, but the weights associated with them will vary from culture to culture. But uh, putting aside for a second the cultural differences, would you say that some of the principles, generally speaking, are more important than the others? Would there be any hierarchy to them or not? Here's what I would say, that not that they're more important. I would say that some are more accessible to us. They, they exist in that situation to a greater extent. So for example, the biggest change I've witnessed since I started investigating the influence process is the effect of the internet, whereby the social proof principle has risen to prominence in terms of its accessibility. We now have access to the opinions of other people around the world, not just in our neighborhood or uh, people around the world who can give us their opinions uh, in chat groups or uh, interviews or star ratings. You know, we have star ratings from thousands of other people regarding a particular product or service. We never had ac access to that before the uh, onset of the internet, right? Now we do, and I saw something remarkable. It was a study that said people who regularly purchase products and services online, in 98% of the time, they check the product reviews first. 98% of them check prod. We can't get 98% of the people in the world to believe that the earth is round. But we get 98% moving to this particular source of influence because it's so available to us now, those star ratings. And that's why there's a particular problem now with those star ratings. It is that they are being faked by uh, practitioners who know how powerful those ratings are and will purchase uh, ratings from people to uh, uh, advocate their products or service, or they will themselves create false reviews and so on. And so the, uh, uh, the people who have those uh, rating systems like Amazon are, have algorithms to try to pick out who those individuals are and which are genuine versus false um, uh, reviews. But even we as, as customers take that into the, the possibility of, of fakes into account. I saw a, a, a research article that showed that the most successful um, rating for a product or service online is not all five stars. It is a range between 4.2 and 4.7 stars. Below 4.2, you say, oh, well, maybe this isn't such a good product. Above 4.7, you say, oh, this may be faked to get so many people who all say that it's, you know, su superior and, uh, you know. So I'm very happy, for example, that my new book, the uh, new version of Influence, 
is getting 4.7 stars <laughs> on Amazon. I don't want it to have 4.8 or 4.9 because people will think that it's it's uh, phony. They'll think that it's been manipulated. So uh, we're in a battle uh, now, but social proof is the battleground on which we are operating. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um... So could you elaborate a little bit more on what it means to get someone to say yes? I mean, what are the goals of these principles? What are the psychological effects that we're aiming at with them? So what we're aiming for is, um, it seems to me, more than one thing, more than immediate compliance. Of course, that's an, an enormous one. We would like people to say yes to us, but we would also like them to be willing to say yes to us again in the future, that the way we have arranged for them to say yes to us is not something that offends them or where they feel coerced or deceived into compliance. Right? So we want to have techniques and practices that are ethical, that honestly inform people into assent, right? That maintain the quality of the relationship that they feel with us as communicators, right? Uh, because <laughs> these, no, no problem. Because these principles apply cross-culturally with some differences as you explained, um, would you say, or would you have any evolutionary explanation for why people in general tend to respond to them with compliance? Yes, I think that you've put your finger on uh, something that we uh, mentioned a, a while ago, and that is, these are the principles that most steer us correctly. When as, as purchasers, as uh, opinion changers, you know, as, as people who change their opinion or their choices or the decisions, if these things truly exist in the situation, right? if there's true authority, there's true social proof, there's true um, scarcity, we are profited by saying yes. Right? That's the evolutionary drive the evolutionary uh, uh, factor that lends itself to uh, compliance when those things are naturally part of a situation. I'll give you an example from uh, my own personal example. Um, a while ago, I was in a, an appliance store and I, and I wasn't looking for a new television, but I saw a big screen TV on sale at a great price. And I knew that this was a very highly rated quality set. So uh, I was standing in front, I was reading some of the materials on, in some brochures and the salesman came to me and he said, I see you're interested in this uh, TV at this price. I can see why this is, this is a great deal for this, uh, this model. And, uh, Right. And uh, I said, okay, well, that's great. And I, I thought to myself, well, what should I do here? Should I buy it? And he said, and it's our last one. And I just got a call from a woman who said she might come down to the shop today to purchase it. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I was rolling out of the store with that set in my cart. Now, I'm supposed to be an expert in the influence process. Didn't matter. I bought this based on that scarcity appeal, right? Because if it was truly the last one, and if there was truly someone who might buy it that day, I didn't want to miss it. Even though I wasn't looking for a new TV, this was a great deal. Okay, so here's the question. Was 
was the um, salesman ethical? Was that truly the case that it was the last one? That there wasn't another set of them in the storeroom in the back that he would just go and fill that space again with it and then s tell the same thing to the next customer who came along. And by the way, there are some appliance stores that train their people to do this. Right? So um, suppose, so I went back the next day to see if there was another set in that spot of the one that I, similar to the one that I bought. No, there wasn't, it was an empty spot. So I immediately went to my office and I wrote a positive review for that shop and that salesperson. Now suppose that he hadn't told me he hadn't used this scarcity principle. He hadn't told me that it was the last one and there was someone else who might buy it that day. And so I went back to, I went back home to think about it. I decided, yeah, I should buy it. And I went the next day and it was gone. And I, and the salesperson came by and I said, wait, where was that? He said, oh, that was our last one. And there was someone else who was thinking of buy it, buying it, and she came by later and she bought it. I would have said, are you crazy? You didn't tell me the truth? You didn't tell me that there was genuine scarcity here? What's wrong with you, man? Right? So the key is when those principles truly exist in the situation, we have an evolutionary advantage to comply. It gives us a better situation, a better outcome. Same thing if he had told me or failed to tell me that it's the most popular model that they have, right? Or all the authorities, all the experts say, this is the best one on the market. If that's true, I'm better informed, I'm educated into assent, right? Not deceived or coerced into it. So that would be my, my way of uh, answering your question of why these principles are not only most, power, most popular among compliance professionals, they're most popular among <laughs> customers because they, if they're true, they really do give us good information uh, in the situation. And should we ever expect these principles to work with everyone? No, we, we shouldn't expect the same principle to work with everyone. So for example, there are, there are particular individuals who um, you could try to convince them about scarcity. You could try to convince them about social proof. You could try to get, convince them about commitment and consistency, and they wouldn't respond to it because uh, they don't like being sold anything. They don't like being convinced by anything. But if their grandchildren ask them to do something, mm. now the unity principle involved it, and they say, I am a grandparent and I can testify to the power of, of grandchildren's requests. They're my, I say yes. I say to myself, is this thing going to hurt them? If the answer is no, I say yes to what they want, just because it's, there's a unity principle. They are, they are my family. They are part of a, of a category that I have, I feel, involves my identity and I say yes. So in every situation, not everybody is going to say yes. Some, in some situations, one of the, to the same principle, but some other principle will probably work on that, on that person. So let's say that someone is trying to learn how to become more persuasive, how to get more complaints from other people and for some reason they have, they have been missing on all of these principles.
questions. Where should they start? I mean, uh, should they start with one of them and just apply one of them until they get it right? Or how should they go about it? No, they should not do that. I have a friend who, he's a marketing professor at the University of Florida. And he set out uh, to find the single most powerful influence principle, the influence approach to get people to say yes. And he spent two years doing this. And I saw him at a conference and he said to me, Bob, I found it. I found the single most powerful influence approach. It is not to have a single influence approach. That's a fool's game. To think that the same principle will be powerful in all circumstances, with all populations, in all settings? No, no. So the answer is you use the principle that's naturally there in the situation. You don't have a favorite principle. That doesn't work in every situation optimally. You have the one, is there true scarcity there? Then you use that. Do you have true popularity? Then you use that. Whatever the principle is that's naturally inherent in the situation, that's the one you use. So my answer to your question of what should somebody who wants to use these principles do to make them work is not to work on one and sharpen their, um, their approach there. It is to learn what the seven principles are. And then go into a situation and look for the one that's naturally present there and bring it to the surface. Bring it to the surface, right? That's the way I would and that, in fact, we have a workshop that where that's how we train people, usually in the business world, to become more influential and ethical at the same time. If you're simply pointing to something that's already there, that's not only ethically acceptable, I think it's ethically commendable. You are in, you are informing people, you're educating people into a good choice. So that would be, I think, the way to approach uh, that particular person's situation, the person who hasn't been doing a good job with the principles yet. So there's no way around learning the seven principles at once. I mean, you can, you can have your experience. Maybe you can decide on the basis of your experience what has always worked. But that's a haphazard and idiosyncratic process. So I would say, no, uh, learn the six principles. Learn about the six principles and use them. <laughs> Um, target, home in on those principles that exist naturally in the situation. You have to know what they are, but every situation you go into, you should ask yourself, well, what's here that I, that's available for me to use where I can properly inform people, you know. Uh, getting into the ethical side of things here, do these principles have anything to do with manipulating or deceiving people? Yes, they do. And there are often people who use uh, uh, these principles in a manipulative way. They do, they, they say this is the most, they lie with statistics to show that this is the most popular uh, product or they, uh, they uh, manufacture product reviews unethically and they do these kinds of things. They say that there's a scarcity of a product when there isn't a scarcity. All of those things are unfortunately the, uh, uh, the techniques that uh, manipulative influence agents use.
Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to ask you about one last topic and... Well, let, let me just add one more thing to that. Oh, yeah. And we now have a tool to help us find out if those people are being manipulative. It's the internet. Once again, we can go and check on them. We can go and look at what others who've been uh, doing business with them have to say about their approaches, their products and services. Mm -hmm. One last topic then. Uh, of course, here to be more rigorous, we'll probably have to go through each and every one of these principles. But what would you say would be some general pieces of advice for people to protect themselves from the negative uses of these principles? Yeah, uh, you're right that it depends on which principle we're talking about. But I think as a general rule, um, step back from the situation when somebody has asked you or uh, pressured you or uh, invited you to say yes to their request. Step back from the situation and separate the presentation of the, uh, print, uh, of the offer from the offer itself. Go to the merits of this product or service and make your choice based on how much you want that thing. Not how much you like the person who's presented it to you or how what this person has said about you know how this is consistent with who you are as a person and so on. No, look at the merits itself and make your own judgment based on, on that set of factors rather than what the f set of factors associated with the presentation of the, author, of the offer. So generally speaking, would you agree that these principles, uh, if we are to apply them ethically, uh, they would improve our chance of convincing other people when we're trying, for example, to sell a product, uh, an idea, persuade them, commit them to do something, or, and yes. so on. Yes, I would say that, and I would go back for some evidence to that study I was telling you about, 6,700 online commercial uh, we uh, websites. Right, where they're selling something or advocating something. And uh, they looked at all kinds of features of within the website. Uh, was there uh, free delivery? Right? Was there a um, um, review? Could you go, could you review all of the fact, all of the uh, different models and so on? Was there a a page that allowed you to do that? Uh, was there a call to action line within the, um, uh, the website? None of those made a big difference. It was the seven principles that were at the top. It was the seven principles that made the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you might say, well, how could you get liking, for example, for a big group of people how, how could you get liking to work for you? In, in Well, it turned out they looked at one factor of liking that got into the top uh, um, features. Those websites that had a welcoming page that you landed on first that said, welcome to our site. We're so pleased to have you with us. Right. We hope that you will enjoy what we have. The way you would welcome a visitor into your home. Right? So they were using the liking principle. How many websites have you seen that have a welcoming letter on the on the landing page? I've not, seen not many. Too. Right. But they significantly outperform those that didn't have a welcoming letter. So 
that's my evidence. I mean, there's, yeah, that's my evidence that in 6,700 websites, the, the principles of influence were at the top. More effective than free shipping. More effective than a call to action line. Things that normally our people tell us are, are associated with, uh, with a choice. And I'm sure there was some influence that they had, but not compared to the principles of psychological influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just like to say that I find it really fascinating that sometimes, and they go through several examples in the book, it's just a matter of changing one word or right. wording things differently, or even just saying something that you know is right, correct, and honest, but you simply miss it for some reason that it makes a world of a difference. Yeah. My, my favorite example has to do with the unity principle. Um, if let's say you have you're, you're working in a corporation and you have a new idea for an initiative that, if it was accepted, would elevate your status as somebody who's who's initiated who's who's developed this idea and so on. But before you move it up the chain to your bosses, you need to get. Um, the buy-in, the, the approval of your colleagues who also think that this is a good idea. So you could use social proof when you present this to, right? How do you get uh, your colleagues to join you in your idea, right? Well, typically what we do is that we give them an outline or a summary of our idea uh, or a blueprint of it. And we ask for their opinion. Could you, could you give me your opinion on this? Mm -hmm. That's a mistake. It's not a mistake to get your, the input of your colleagues. It's a mistake to ask for their opinion. Because when you ask for an opinion, you get a critic. You get someone who steps back from you and analyzes inside their own um, uh, experiences and and preferences and opinions, whether they think this is a good idea. If you change one word, and instead of asking for their opinion, you ask for their advice. Now you don't get a critic, you get a partner. You get someone who is unified with you in this task, right? Someone who feels part of it with you, right? And the research is very clear. Not only do you get more approval and positive ratings of your idea, you get more, um, more instructive input, more constructive suggestions about how to improve it. Because you've made people a partner with you with one word. By the way, subsequent research has shown not only does this work better than asking for an opinion, it works better than asking for feedback or asking for what's your expectation of how this idea would, uh, would work, right? Both of those are separate, are, are requests that separate this person from you they go into themselves. If you ask for their, if, if you ask for their, instead of any of those, right? If you ask for their advice, they join you and you get significantly better. So that's a perfect example. It's the one, my favorite example of what you just said, small things can make a big difference because those small things are harnessing big principles of influence, in this case, the, the unity principle, right? Yeah. So in that case, just asking and changing one word, advice instead of opinion, 
feedback or uh, what was the other one? So expectation. Yeah, exactly. Give us your expectation of how this will work out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. So uh, the book is again, Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, Dr. Cialdini, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yes. Um, the best place is our website, influenceatwork.com. Uh, so, influence at work is all one word, dot com. Very well. So, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show, and it's been a, an honor to have you. Well, I enjoyed our uh, conversation. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this episode until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there starting at $1 per month. You also have links to PayPal. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Fordens, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenya, John Connors, Paulina Varen, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, o Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernardo Uniga, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, and Sonny Smith. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.